Chapter 3 The Muster of Rohan Now all roads were running together to the east to meet the coming of war and the onset of the shadow. And even as Pippin stood at the great gate of the city, and saw the prince of Dol Amroth ride in with his banners, the king of Rohan came down out of the hills. Day was waning. In the last rays of the sun the riders cast long pointed shadows that went on before them. Darkness had already crept beneath the murmuring fir woods that clothed the steep mountain sides. The king rode now slowly at the end of the day. Presently the path turned round a huge bare shoulder of rock, and plunged into the gloom of soft-sighing trees. Down, down they went in a long winding file. When at last they came to the bottom of the gorge, they found that evening had fallen in the deep places. The sun was gone. Twilight lay upon the waterfalls. All day far below them a leaping stream had run down from the high pass behind cleaving its narrow way between pine-clad walls, and now through a stony gate it flowed out and passed into a wider vale. The riders followed it, and suddenly Harrowdale lay before them, loud with the noise of waters in the evening. There the white snowborn, joined by the lesser stream, went rushing, fuming on the stones, down to Edoras and the green hills and the plains. Away to the right at the head of the great dale, the mighty Starkhorn loomed up above its vast buttresses swathed in cloud, but its jagged peak, clothed in everlasting snow, gleamed far above the world, blue shadowed upon the east, red stained by the sunset in the west. Merry looked out in wonder upon this strange country, of which he had heard many tales upon their long road. It was a skyless world, in which his eye, through dim gulfs of shadowy air, saw only ever-mounting slopes, great walls of stone behind great walls, and frowning precipices wreathed with mist. He sat for a moment half-dreaming, listening to the noise of water, the whisper of dark trees, the crack of stone, and the vast waiting silence that brooded behind all sound. He loved mountains, or he had loved the thought of them marching on the edge of stories brought from far away, but now he was borne down by the insupportable weight of Middle-earth. He longed to shut out the immensity in a quiet room by a fire. He was very tired, for though they had ridden slowly, they had ridden with very little rest. Hour after hour, for nearly three weary days, he had jogged up and down, over passes, and through long dales, and across many streams. Sometimes, where the way was broader, he had ridden at the king's side, not noticing that many of the riders smiled to see the two together, the hobbit on his little shaggy grey pony, and the lord of Rohan on his great white horse. Then he had talked to Theoden, telling him about his home and the doings of the shire folk, or listening in turn to tales of the mark and of its mighty men of old. But most of the time, especially on this last day, Meddy had ridden by himself, just behind the king, saying nothing, and trying to understand the slow, sonorous speech of Rohan that he heard the men behind him using. It was a language in which there seemed to be many words that he knew, though spoken more richly and more strongly than in the Shire, yet he could not piece the words together. At times some rider would lift up his clear voice in stirring song, and Meddy felt his heart leap though he didn't know what it was about. All the same, he'd been lonely, and never more so than now at the day's end. He wondered where in all this strange world Pippin had got to, and what would become of Aragorn and Legolas and Gimli. Then suddenly, like a cold touch on his heart, he thought of Frodo and Sam. "'I'm forgetting them,' he said to himself reproachfully, "'and yet they're more important than all the rest of us. And I came to help them.' but now they must be hundreds of miles away, if they're still alive. He shivered. Harrowdale at last, said Aomer. Our journey is almost at an end. They halted. The paths out of the narrow gorge fell steeply. Only a glimpse, as through a tall window, could be seen of the great valley in the gloaming below. A single small light could be seen twinkling by the river. 
The journey is over, maybe, said Theoden, but I have far yet to go. Last night the moon was full, and in the morning I shall ride to Edras to the gathering of the mark. But if you would take my counsel, said Aylmer in a low voice, you would then return hither until the war is over, lost or won. Theoden smiled. Nay, my son, for so I will call you, speak not the soft words of worm tongue in my old ears. He drew himself up and looked back at the long line of his men fading into the dust behind. Long years in the space of days it seems since I rode west, but never will I lean on a staff again. If the war is lost, what good will be my hiding in the hills? And if it's won, what grief will it be, even if I fall, spending my last strength? But we will leave this now. Tonight I will lie in the hold of Dunharrow. One evening of peace at least is left us. Let us ride on. In the deepening dusk they came down into the valley. Here the snowborn flowed near to the western walls of the dale, and soon the path led them to a ford where the shallow waters murmured loudly on the stones. The ford was guarded. As the king approached, many men sprang up out of the shadows of the rocks, and when they saw the king they cried with glad voices, Theoden king! Theoden king! The king of the mark returns! Then one blew a long call on a horn. It echoed in the valley. Other horns answered it, and light shone out across the river. And suddenly there rose a great chorus of trumpets from high above, sounding from some hollow place, as it seemed, that gathered their notes into one voice, and sent it rolling and beating on the walls of stone. So the king of the mark came back victorious out to the west to Dunharrow, beneath the feet of the white mountains. There he found the remaining strength of his people already assembled, for as soon as his coming was known, captains rode to meet him at the ford, bearing messages from Gandalf. Doonhair, chieftain of the folk of Harrowdale, was at their head. "'At dawn three days ago, Lord,' he said, "'Shadowfax came like a wind out of the west to Edoras, and Gandalf brought tidings of your victory to gladden our hearts. But he brought also word from you to hasten the gathering of the riders, and then came the winged shadow.' "'The winged shadow?' said Theoden. "'We saw it also. "'But that was in the dead of night before Gandalf left us.' "'Maybe, Lord,' said Dunhir. "'Yet the same, or another like to it, "'a flying darkness in the shape of a monstrous bird, "'passed over Edoras that morning, "'and all men were shaken with fear. "'For it stooped upon Meadowseld, "'and as it came low, almost to the gable, "'there came a cry that stopped our hearts.' Then it was that Gandalf counselled us not to assemble in the fields, but to meet you here in the valley under the mountains. And he bade us to kindle no more lights or fires than barest need asked. So it has been done. Gandalf spoke with great authority. We trust that it is as you would wish. Nought has been seen in Harrowdale of these evil things. It is well, said Theoden. I will ride now to the hold, and there before I go to rest— I will meet the marshals and captains. Let them come to me as soon as may be. The road now led eastward, straight across the valley, which was at that point little more than half a mile in width. Flats and meads of rough grass, grey now in the falling night, lay all about, but in front, on the far side of the dale, Medi saw a frowning wall, a last outlier of the great roots of the Starkhorn, cloven by the river in ages past. On all the level spaces there was great concourse of men. Some thronged to the roadside, hailing the king and the riders from the west with glad cries, but stretching away into the darkness behind there were ordered rows of tents and booths, and lines of picketed horses, and great store of arms, and piled spears bristling like thickets of new-planted trees. Now all the great assembly was falling into shadow, and yet— Though the night chill blew cold from the heights, no lanterns glowed, no fires were lit. Watchmen, heavily cloaked, paced to and fro. Merry wondered how many riders there were. He couldn't guess their number in the gathering gloom, but it looked to him like a great army, many thousands strong. While he was peering from side to side, the king's party came up under the looming cliff on the eastern side of the valley. 
and there suddenly the path began to climb, and Mary looked up in amazement. He was on a road the like of which he had never seen before, a great work of men's hands in years beyond the reach of song. Upward it wound, coiling like a snake, boring its way across the sheer slope of rock. Steep as a stair, it looped backwards and forwards as it climbed. Up it horses could walk, and wains could be slowly hauled, but no enemy could come that way, except out of the air, if it was defended from above. At each turn of the road there were great standing stones that had been carved in the likeness of men, huge and clumsy-limbed, squatting cross-legged, with their stumpy arms folded on fat bellies. Some, in the wearing of the years, had lost all features, save the dark holes of their eyes that still stared sadly at the passers-by. The riders hardly glanced at them. The Pukulben, they called them, and he did them little. No power or terror was left in them. But Mary gazed at them with wonder and a feeling almost of pity as they loomed up mournfully in the dusk. After a while he looked back and found that he had already climbed some hundreds of feet above the valley, but still far below he could dimly see a winding line of riders crossing the ford and filing along the road toward the camp prepared for them. Only the king and his guard were going up into the hold. At last the king's company came to a sharp brink, and the climbing road passed into a cutting between walls of rock, and so went up a short slope and out onto a wide upland. The Firienfeld, men called it, a green mountain field of grass and heath, high above the deep delved courses of the snowborn, laid upon the lap of the great mountains behind. The stark horn southwards, and northwards the saw-toothed mass of Iron Saga, between which there faced the riders the grim black walls of the Drimmerberg, the haunted mountain rising out of steep slopes of sombre pines. Dividing the upland into two, there marched a double line of unshaped standing stones that dwindled into the dusk and vanished in the trees. Those who dared to follow that road soon came to the black dim holt under Drimmerberg, and the menace of the pillar of stone, and the yawning shadow of the forbidden door. Such was the dark Dunharrow, the work of long-forgotten men. Their name was lost, and no song or legend remembered it. For what purpose they had made this place, as a town or secret temple or a tomb of kings, none could say. Here they labored in the dark years, before ever a ship came to the western shores, or Gondor of the Dúnedain was built. And now they had vanished, and only the old Pukul men were left, still sitting at the turnings of the road. Mary stared at the lines of marching stones. They were worn and black. Some were leaning, some were fallen, some cracked or broken. They looked like rows of old and hungry teeth. He wondered what they could be and he hoped that the king was not going to follow them into the darkness beyond. Then he saw that there were clusters of tents and booths on either side of the stony way, but these were not set near the trees, and seemed rather to huddle away from them towards the brink of the cliff. The greater number were on the right, where the Firienfeld was wider, and on the left there was a smaller camp, in the midst of which stood a tall pavilion. From this side a rider now came out to meet them, and they turned from the road. As they drew near, Mary saw that the rider was a woman with long braided hair gleaming in the twilight. Yet she wore a helm, and was clad to the waist like a warrior, and girded with a sword. Hail, Lord of the Mark, she cried. My heart is glad at your returning. And you, Eowyn, said Theoden, is all well with you? All is well, she answered. Yet it seemed to Mary that her voice belied her, and he would have thought that she had been weeping, if that could be believed of one so stern a face. All is well. It was a weary road for the people to take, torn suddenly from their homes. There were hard words, for it is long since war has driven us from the green fields, but there have been no evil deeds. All is now ordered, as you see, and your lodging is prepared for you for I have had full tidings of you, and knew the hour of your coming. So Aragorn has come, then, said Elmer, 
Is he still here? No, he's gone, said Eowyn, turning away and looking at the mountains dark against the east and south. Whither did he go? asked Eoma. I don't know, she answered. He came at night and rode away yestermorn ere the sun had climbed over the mountain tops. He's gone. You are grieved, daughter, said Theoden. What's happened? Tell me. Did he speak of that road? He pointed away along the darkening lines of stones toward the Dwimmerberg. Of the paths of the dead? Yes, Lord, said Erwin. And he has passed into the shadows from which none have returned. I could not dissuade him. He is gone. Then our paths are sundered, said Elmer. He is lost. We must ride without him, and our hope dwindles. Slowly they passed through the short heath and upland grass, speaking no more, until they came to the king's pavilion. There Mary found that everything was made ready, and that he himself was not forgotten. A little tent had been pitched for him beside the king's lodging, and there he sat alone, while men passed to and fro, going into the king and taking counsel with him. Night came on, and the half-seen heads of the mountains westward were crowned with stars, but the east was dark and blank. The marching stones faded slowly from sight, but still behind them, blacker than the gloom, brooded the vast, crouching shadow of the Dwimorberg. The paths of the dead, he muttered to himself. The paths of the dead, what does all this mean? They've all left me now. They've all gone to some doom. Gandalf and Pippin to the war in the east, and Sam and Frodo to Mordor, and Strider and Legolas and Gimli to the paths of the dead. But my turn will come soon enough, I suppose. I wonder what they're all talking about, and what the king means to do, for I must go where he goes now. In the midst of these gloomy thoughts he suddenly remembered that he was very hungry, and he got up to go and see if anyone else in this strange camp felt the same. But at that very moment a trumpet sounded, and a man came summoning him, the king's esquire, to wait at the king's board. In the inner part of the pavilion was a small space, curtained off with broidered hangings and strewn with skins and there at a small table sat Theoden and Aylmer and Eowyn, and Dunhir, Lord of Harrowdale. Mary stood beside the king's stool and waited on him, till presently the old man, coming out of deep thought, turned to him and smiled. "'Come, Master Meriadoc,' he said. "'You shall not stand. You shall sit beside me, as long as I remain in my own lands, and lighten my heart with tales.' Room was made for the hobbit at the king's left hand, but no one called for any tale. There was indeed little speech, and they ate and drank for the most part in silence, until at last, plucking up courage, Mary asked the question that was tormenting him. "'Twice now, Lord, I've heard of the paths of the dead,' he said. "'What are they? And where has Strider, I mean the Lord Aragorn, where has he gone?' The king sighed, but no one answered, until at last Aylmer spoke. "'We don't know, and our hearts are heavy,' he said. "'But as for the paths of the dead, you have yourself walked on their first steps. Nay, I speak no words of ill omen. The road that we have climbed is the approach to the door, yonder in the dim holt. But what lies beyond no man knows.' "'No man knows,' said Theoden. Yet ancient legend, now seldom spoken, has somewhat to report. If these old tales speak true that have come down from father to son in the house of Aeol, then the door under Dwimmerberg leads to a secret way that goes beneath the mountain to some forgotten end. But none have ever ventured in to search its secrets, since Baldor, son of Brago, passed the door and was never seen among men again. A rash vow he spoke, as he drained the horn at that feast which Brago made to hallow new-built Meduseld, and he came never to the high seat of which he was the heir. Folk say that dead men out of the dark years guard the way, and will suffer no living man to come to their hidden halls, but at whiles they may themselves be seen passing out of the door like shadows, and down the stony road. 
Then the people of Harrowdale shut fast their doors, and shroud their windows, and are afraid. But the dead come seldom forth, and only at times of great unquiet and coming death. Yet it is said in Harrowdale, said Eowyn in a low voice, that in the moonless nights but little while ago a great host in strange array passed by. Whence they came none knew, but they went up the stony road, and vanished into the hill, as if they went to keep a tryst. "'Then why is Aragorn gone that way?' asked Mary. "'Don't you know anything that would explain it?' "'Unless he has spoken words to you as his friend that we have not heard,' said Alma. "'None now in the land of the living can tell his purpose.' "'Greatly changed he seemed to me since I first saw him in the king's house,' said Eowyn. "'Grimmer, older, fay, I thought him, and like one whom the dead call.' "'Maybe he was called,' said Theoden, "'and my heart tells me that I shall not see him again. "'Yet he is a kingly man of high destiny, "'and take comfort in this, daughter, "'since comfort you seem to need in your grief for this guest. "'It said that when the Aorlingers came out of the north "'and passed at length up the Snowborn, "'seeking strong places of refuge in time of need, "'Brago and his son Baldor climbed the stair of the hold, "'and so came before the door.' On the threshold sat an old man, aged beyond guess of years. Tall and kingly he had been, but now he was withered as an old stone. Indeed, for stone they took him, for he moved not, and he said no word until they sought to pass him by and enter. And then a voice came out of him, as it were out of the ground, and to their amaze it spoke in the western tongue. The way is shut. Then they halted and looked at him, and saw that he lived still, but he didn't look at them. The way is shut, his voice said again. It was made by those who are dead, and the dead keep it until the time comes. The way is shut. And when will that time be? said Valdor. But no answer did he ever get, for the old man died in that hour and fell upon his face and no other tidings of the ancient dwellers in the mountains of our folk ever learned. Yet maybe at last the time foretold has come, and Aragorn may pass. But how shall a man discover whether that time be come or no, save by daring the door? said Eomer. And that way I wouldn't go, though all the hosts of Mordor stood before me, and I were alone and had no other refuge. Alas, that a fey mood should fall on a man so great-hearted in this hour of need! Are there not evil things enough abroad, without seeking them under the earth? War is at hand. He paused, for at that moment there was a noise outside, a man's voice crying the name of Theoden, and the challenge of the guard. Presently the captain of the guard thrust aside the curtain. A man is here, Lord, he said. An errant rider of Gondor. He wishes to come before you at once. Let him come, said Theoden. A tall man entered, and Merry choked back a cry. For a moment it seemed to him that Boromir was alive again and had returned. Then he saw that it was not so. The man was a stranger, though as like to Boromir as if he were one of his kin, tall and grey-eyed and proud. He was clad as a rider, with a cloak of dark green over a coat of fine mail. On the front of his helm was wrought a small silver star. In his hand he bore a single arrow, black-feathered and barbed with steel, but the point was painted red. He sank on one knee and presented the arrow to Theoden. "'Hail, Lord of the Rohirrim, friend of Gondor,' he said. "'Here gone I am, errant rider of Denethor, who bring you this token of war. Gondor is in great need. Often the Rohirrim have aided us. But now the Lord Denethor asks for all your strength and all your speed, lest Gondor fall at last. The red arrow, said Theoden, holding it, as one who receives a summons long expected and yet dreadful when it comes. His hand trembled. The red arrow has not been seen in the mark in all my years. Has it indeed come to that? And what does the Lord Denethor reckon that all my strength and all my speed may be? "'That is best known to yourself, Lord,' said Hergon. "'But ere long it may well come to pass that Minas Tirith is surrounded, 
and unless you have the strength to break a siege of many powers, the Lord Denethor bids me say that he judges that the strong arms of the Rohirrim would be better within his walls than without. But he knows that we are a people who fight rather upon horseback and in the open, and that we are also a scattered people, and time is needed for the gathering of our riders. Is it not true, Ergon, that the Lord of Minas Tirith knows more than he sets in his message? For we are already at war, as you have seen, and you don't find us all unprepared. Gandalf the Grey has been among us, and even now we are mustering for battle in the east. What the Lord Denethor may know or guess of all these things I can't say, answered Heogod. But indeed our case is desperate. My Lord does not issue any command to you. He begs you only to remember old friendship and oaths long spoken, and for your own good to do all that you may. It is reported to us that many kings have ridden in from the east to the service of Mordor. From the north to the field of Dagolad there is skirmish and rumour of war. In the south the Haradrim are moving, and fear has fallen on all our coastlands, so that little help will come to us thence. Make haste, for it's before the walls of Minas Tirith that the doom of our time will be decided, and if the tide be not stemmed there, then it will flow over all the fair fields of Rohan, and even in this hold among the hills there shall be no refuge. Dark tidings, said Theoden, yet not all unguessed. But say to Denethor that even if Rohan itself felt no peril, still we would come to his aid. But we have suffered much loss in our battles with Saruman the traitor, and we must still think of our frontier to the north and east, as his own tidings make clear. So great a power as the Dark Lord seems now to wield might well contain us in battle before the city, and yet strike with great force across the river away beyond the gate of kings. But we will speak no longer counsels of prudence. We will come. The weapon take was set for the morrow. When all is ordered, we will set out. Ten thousand spears I might have sent riding over the plain to the dismay of your foes. It will be less now, I fear, for I will not leave my strongholds all unguarded. Yet six thousands at the least shall ride behind me. For say to Denethor that in this hour the king of the Mark himself will come down to the land of Gondor, though maybe he will not ride back. But it is a long road, and man and beast must reach the end with strength to fight. A week it may be, from tomorrow's morn, ere you hear the cry of the sons of Aeol coming from the north. A week, said Heogon. If it must be so, it must. But you are like to find only ruined walls in seven days from now, unless other help unlooked for comes. Still, you may at the least disturb the orcs and swarthy men from their feasting in the White Tower. At the least we will do that, said Theoden. But I myself am new come from battle and long journey, and I will now go to rest. Tarry here this night. Then you shall look on the muster of Rohan, and ride away the gladder for the sight, and the swifter for the rest. In the morning counsels are best, and night changes many thoughts. With that the king stood up, and they all rose. Go now each to your rest, he said, and sleep well. And you, Master Meriadoc, I need no more tonight, but be ready to my call as soon as the sun is risen. I will be ready, said Mary, even if you bid me ride with you on the paths of the dead. Speak not words of omen, said the king, for there may be more roads than one that could bear that name. But I didn't say that I would bid you ride with me on any road. Good night. I won't be left behind to be called for on return, said Mary. I won't be left, I won't. And repeating this over and over again to himself, he fell asleep at last in his tent. He was wakened by a man shaking him. Wake up, wake up, Master Hobbitler, he cried and at length Mary came out of deep dreams and sat up with a start. It still seemed very dark, he thought. "'What's the matter?' he asked. "'The king calls you.' "'But the sun has not risen yet,' said Mary. "'No, and will not rise to-day, Master Halbitter, nor ever again, one would think, under this cloud. But time does not stand still, though the sun be lost. Make haste.' Flinging on some clothes, Mary looked outside. 
The world was darkling. The very air seemed brown, and all things about were black and grey and shadowless. There was a great stillness. No shape of cloud could be seen, unless it were far away westward, where the furthest groping fingers of the great gloom still crawled onwards, and a little light leaked through them. Overhead there hung a heavy roof, sombre and featureless, and light seemed rather to be failing than growing. Mary saw many folk standing, looking up and muttering. All their faces were grey and sad, and some were afraid. With a sinking heart he made his way to the king. Here gone the rider of Gondor was there before him, and beside him stood now another man, like him and dressed alike, but shorter and broader. As Mary entered he was speaking to the king. "'It comes from Mordor, Lord,' he said. "'It began last night at sunset. From the hills in the east fold of your realm I saw it rise and creep across the sky, and all night as I rode it came behind, eating up the stars. Now the great cloud hangs over all the land between here and the mountains of shadow, and it is deepening. War has already begun.' For a while the king sat silent. At last he spoke. "'So we come to it in the end,' he said, "'the great battle of our time, in which many things shall pass away. But at least there is no longer need for hiding. We will ride the straight way and the open road, and with all our speed. The muster shall begin at once, and wait for none that tarry. Have you good store in Minas Tirith? For if we must ride now in all haste, then we must ride light, with but meal and water enough to last us into a battle.' "'We have very great store long prepared,' answered he again. "'Right now as light and as swift as you may.' "'Then call the heralds, Aylmer,' said Theoden. "'Let the riders be marshalled.' Aylmer went out, and presently the trumpets rang in the hold and were answered by many others from below, but their voices no longer sounded clear and brave as they had seemed to Mary the night before. Dull they seemed and harsh in the heavy air, braying ominously. The king turned to Mary. "'I am going to war, Master Meriardoc, he said. "'In a little while I shall take the road. "'I release you from my service, but not from my friendship. "'You shall abide here, and if you will, "'you shall serve the Lady Eowyn, "'who will govern the folk in my stead.' "'But, but, Lord,' Mary stammered, "'I offered you my sword. "'I don't want to be parted from you like this, Theoden King.' and as all my friends have gone to the battle, I should be ashamed to stay behind. But we ride on horses tall and swift, said Theoden, and great though your heart be, you cannot ride on such beasts. Then tie me on to the back of one, or let me hang on a stirrup or something, said Mary. It's a long way to run, but run I shall, if I cannot ride, even if I wear my feet off and arrive weeks too late. Theoden smiled. "'Rather than that I would bear you with me on Snowmane,' he said. "'But at the least you shall ride with me to Edoras, and look on Meadowselt. "'For that way I shall go. "'So far Stibber can bear you. "'The great race will not begin till we reach the plains.' "'Then Eowyn rose up. "'Come now, Mary Ardoch, she said. "'I will show you the gear that I have prepared for you.' "'They went out together.' "'This request only did Aragorn make to me,' said Heowen, as they passed among the tents, "'that you should be armed for battle. I have granted it as I could, for my heart tells me that you will need such gear ere the end.' Now she led Mary to a booth among the lodges of the king's guard, and there an armourer brought out to her a small helm, and a round shield, and other gear. "'No mail have we to fit you,' said Heowen, nor any time for the forging of such a hauberk. But here is also a stout jerkin of leather, a belt, and a knife. A sword you have. Mary bowed, and the lady showed him the shield, which was like the shield that had been given to Gimli, and it bore on it the device of the white horse. Take all these things, she said, and bear them to good fortune. Farewell now, Master Mary Ardoch. Yet maybe we shall meet again, you and I. So it was that amid a gathering gloom the king of the mark made ready to lead all his riders on the eastward road. Hearts were heavy, and many quailed in the shadow. But they were a stern people, loyal to their lord, 
and little weeping or murmuring was heard, even in the camp in the hold where the exiles from Edoras were housed, women and children and old men. Doom hung over them, but they faced it silently. Two swift hours passed, and now the king sat upon his white horse, glimmering in the half-light. Proud and tall he seemed, though the hair that flowed beneath his high helm was like snow, and many marvelled at him, and took heart to see him unbent and unafraid. There on the wide flats beside the noisy river were marshalled in many companies well nigh five and fifty hundreds of riders fully armed, and many hundreds of other men with spare horses lightly burdened. A single trumpet sounded. The king raised his hand, and then silently the host of the mark began to move. Foremost went twelve of the king's household men, riders of renown. Then the king followed with Aymer on his right. He had said farewell to Eowyn above in the hold, and the memory was grievous. But now he turned his mind to the road that lay ahead. Behind him Merry rode on Stibber with the errand riders of Gondor, and behind them again twelve more of the king's household. They passed down the long ranks of waiting men with stern and unmoved faces. But when they had come almost to the end of the line, one looked up glancing keenly at the hobbit. A young man, Merry thought as he returned the glance, less in height and girth than most. He caught the glint of clear grey eyes, and then he shivered, for it came suddenly to him that it was the face of one without hope who goes in search of death. On down the grey road they went beside the snowborn, rushing on its stones, through the hamlets of Underharrow and Upborn, where many sad faces of women looked out from dark doors, and so without horn or harp or music of men's voices the great ride into the east began, with which the songs of Rohan were busy for many long lives of men thereafter. From dark Don Harrow in the dim morning, with Thane and Captain rode Thangle's son, to Edoras he came, the ancient halls of the Mark Warrens, mist and shrouded, golden timbers were in gloom mantled, farewell he bade to his free people, hearth and high seat and the hallowed places, where long he had feasted. Stood, ere the light had faded, forth rode the king, fear behind him, fate before him, fealty kept he, oaths he had taken, all fulfilled them, forth rode Theoden. Five nights and days, east and onward, rode the Eoringers, through fold and fen, march and the Firian wood, six thousand spears, to sun lending, Mundberg the mighty, under Mindolwin, seeking city in the south kingdom, full beleaguered, fire encircled, doom drove them all. Darkness took them, horse and horseman, hoofbeats afar, sank into silence, so the songs tell us. It was indeed in deepening gloom that the king came to Edoras, although it was then but noon by the hour. There he halted only a short while and strengthened his host by some threescore of riders that came late to the weapon take. Now having eaten, he made ready to set out again, and he wished his esquire a kind farewell. But Mary begged, for the last time, not to be parted from him. "'This is no journey for such steeds as Stibber, as I've told you,' said Theoden. "'And in such a battle as we think to make on the fields of Gondor, what would you do, Master Mary Ardoch? sword thane though you be, and greater of heart than of stature. As for that, who can tell? answered Mary. But why, Lord, did you receive me as sword thane, if not to stay by your side? And I would not have it said of me in song, only that I was always left behind. I received you for your safekeeping, answered Theoden, and also to do as I might bid. None of my riders can bear you as burden. If the battle were before my gates, maybe your deeds would be remembered by the minstrels. 
but it is a hundred leagues and two to Mundberg when Denethor is lord. I will say no more. Merry bowed and went away unhappily, and stared at the lines of horsemen. Already the companies were preparing to start. Men were tightening girths, looking to saddles, caressing their horses. Some gazed uneasily at the lowering sky. Unnoticed, a rider came up and spoke softly in the hobbit's ear. "'Where will wants not, a way opens, so we say,' he whispered. "'And so I have found myself.' Mary looked up, and saw that it was the young rider whom he had noticed in the morning. "'You wish to go whither the Lord of the Mark goes? I see it in your face.' "'I do,' said Mary. "'Then you shall go with me.' said the rider. I will bear you before me, under my cloak, until we are far afield, and this darkness is yet darker. Such good will should not be denied. Say no more to any man, but come. Thank you indeed, said Mary. Thank you, sir, though I don't know your name. Do you not? said the rider softly. Then call me Durnhelm. Thus it came to pass, that when the king set out, before Durnhelm sat Meriadoc the hobbit, and the great grey steed Windfoller made little of the burden, for Durnhelm was less in weight than many men, though lithe and well knit in frame. On into the shadow they rode, in the willow thickets where Snowborn flowed into Entwash, twelve leagues east of Edoras, they camped that night, and then on again through the fold and through the fenmarch, where, to their right, Great oakwoods climbed on the skirts of the hills under the shades of dark Halifirian by the borders of Gondor. But away to their left the mists lay on the marshes fed by the mouths of Entwash. And as they rode, rumour came of war in the north. Lone men, riding wild, brought word of foes assailing their east borders, of orc hosts marching in the wold of Rohan. "'Ride on! Ride on!' cried Aomer. "'Too late now to turn aside!' The fens of Entwash must guard our flank. Haste now we need. Ride on. And so King Theoden departed from his own realm, and mile by mile the long road wound away, and the beacon hills marched past. Caladhad, Minrimon, Erelas, Nardal. But their fires were quenched. All the lands were grey and still, and ever the shadow deepened before them, and hope waned in every heart. Chapter 4 The Siege of Gondor Pippin was roused by Gandalf. Candles were lit in their chamber, for only a dim twilight came through the windows. The air was heavy as with approaching thunder. "'What's the time?' said Pippin, yawning. "'Past the second hour,' said Gandalf. Time to get up and make yourself presentable. You are summoned to the lord of the city to learn your new duties. And will he provide breakfast? No, I have provided it. All that you will get till noon. Food is now doled out by order. Pippin looked ruefully at the small loaf and, he thought, very inadequate pat of butter which was set out for him, beside a cup of thin milk. "'Why did you bring me here?' he said. "'You know quite well,' said Gandalf, "'to keep you out of mischief. "'And if you don't like being here, "'you can remember that you brought it on yourself.' "'Pippin said no more. "'Before long he was walking with Gandalf once more "'down the cold corridor to the door of the tower hall. "'There Denethor sat in a grey gloom, "'like an old patient spider, Pippin thought. "'He didn't seem to have moved since the day before.' He beckoned Gandalf to a seat, but Pippin was left for a while standing unheeded. Presently the old man turned to him. "'Well, Master Peregrine, I hope that you used yesterday to your profit and to your liking, though I fear that the board is bearer in this city than you could wish.' Pippin had an uncomfortable feeling that most of what he had said or done was somehow known to the lord of the city, and much was guessed of what he thought as well. He didn't answer. "'What would you do in my service?' "'I thought, sir, that you would tell me my duties.' "'I will, when I learn what you are fit for,' said Denethor. 
but that I shall learn soonest, maybe, if I keep you beside me. The esquire of my chamber has begged leave to go to the out-garrison, so you shall take his place for a while. You shall wait on me, bear errands, and talk to me, if war and council leave me any leisure. Can you sing? Yes, said Pippin. Well, yes, well enough for my own people, but we have no songs fit for great halls and evil times, lord. We seldom sing of anything more terrible than wind or rain, and most of my songs are about things that make us laugh, or about food and drink, of course. And why should such songs be unfit for my halls, or for such hours as these? We who have lived long under the shadow may surely listen to echoes from a land untroubled by it. Then we may feel that our vigil was not fruitless, though it may have been thankless. Pippin's heart sank. He didn't relish the idea of singing any song of the Shah to the Lord of Minas Tirith, certainly not the comic ones that he knew best. They were too, well, rustic for such an occasion. He was, however, spared the ordeal for the present. He was not commanded to sing. Denethor turned to Gandalf, asking questions about the Rohirrim and their policies, and the position of Eomer, the king's nephew. Pippin marvelled at the amount that the Lord seemed to know about a people that lived far away, though it must, he thought, be many years since Denethor himself had ridden abroad. Presently Denethor waved to Pippin, and dismissed him again for a while. "'Go to the armories of the Citadel,' he said, "'and get you there the livery and gear of the tower. It will be ready. It was commanded yesterday. Return when you are clad.' It was as he said and Pippin soon found himself arrayed in strange garments, all of black and silver. He had a small hauberk, its rings forged of steel, maybe, yet black as jet, and a high-crowned helm with small raven wings on either side, set with a silver star in the center of the circlet. Above the mail was a short surcoat of black, but broidered on the breast in silver with a token of the tree. His old clothes were folded and put away, but he was permitted to keep the grey cloak of Lorien, though not to wear it when on duty. He looked now, had he known it, verily Ernil y Ferianeth, the prince of the halflings, that folk had called him, but he felt uncomfortable, and the gloom began to weigh on his spirits. It was dark and dim all day. From the sunless dawn until evening the heavy shadow had deepened, and all hearts in the city were oppressed. Far above a great cloud streamed slowly westward from the black land, devouring light, borne upon a wind of war. But below the air was still and breathless, as if all the vale of Anduin waited for the onset of a ruinous storm. About the eleventh hour, released at last for a while from service, Pippin came out and went in search of food and drink to cheer his heavy heart and to make his task of waiting more supportable. In the messes he met Berigond again, who had just come from an errand over the Pelennor out to the guard towers upon the causeway. Together they strolled out to the walls, for Pippin felt imprisoned indoors and stifled even in the lofty citadel. Now they sat side by side again, in the embrasure looking eastward, where they had eaten and talked the day before. It was the sunset hour but the great pall had now stretched far into the west, and only as it sank at last into the sea did the sun escape to send out a brief farewell gleam before the night, even as Frodo saw it at the crossroads touching the head of the fallen king. But to the fields of the Pelennor, under the shadow of Mindoluin, there came no gleam. They were brown and drear. Already it seemed years to Pippin, since he had sat there before, in some half-forgotten time, when he had still been a hobbit, a light-hearted wanderer touched little by the perils he had passed through. Now he was one small soldier in a city preparing for a great assault, clad in the proud but sombre manner of the Tower of God. In some other time and place Pippin might have been pleased with his new array, but he knew now that he was taking part in no play. He was in deadly earnest the servant of a grim master in the greatest peril. The hauberk was burdensome, and the helm weighed upon his head. His cloak he had cast aside upon the seat. 
He turned his tired gaze away from the darkling fields below and yawned, and then he sighed. "'You are weary of this day?' said Berigond. "'Yes,' said Pippin. "'Very. Tired out with idleness and waiting. I've kicked my heels at the door of my master's chamber for many slow hours, while he's debated with Gandalf and the prince and other great persons. And I'm not used, Master Berigond, to waiting hungry on others while they eat. It's a sore trial for a hobbit, that. No doubt you will think I should feel the honour more deeply. But what is the good of such honour? Indeed, what is the good even of food and drink under this creeping shadow? What does it mean? The very air seems thick and brown. Do you often have such glooms when the wind is in the east? Nay, said Berigond, this is no weather of the world. This is some device of his malice, some broil of fume from the mountain of fire that he sends to darken hearts and counsel. And so it doth indeed. I wish the Lord Faramir would return. He would not be dismayed. But now... Who knows if he will ever come back across the river out of the darkness? Yes, said Pippin. Gandalf, too, is anxious. He was disappointed, I think, not to find Faramir here. And where has he got to himself? He left the Lord's council before the noon meal, and in no good mood either, I thought. Perhaps he has some foreboding of bad news. Suddenly, as they talked, they were stricken dumb frozen, as it were, to listening stones. Pippin cowered down with his hands pressed to his ears, but Berigond, who had been looking out from the battlement as he spoke to Faramir, remained there, stiffened, staring out with starting eyes. Pippin knew the shuddering cry that he had heard. It was the same that he had heard long ago in the marriage of the Shah, but now it was grown in power and hatred, piercing the heart with a poisonous despair. At last Berigon spoke with an effort. "'They have come,' he said. "'Take courage and look. "'There are fell things below.' Reluctantly Pippin climbed on to the seat and looked out over the wall. The Pelennor lay dim beneath him, fading away to the scarce guessed line of the great river. But now, wheeling swiftly across it, like shadows of untimely night, he saw in the middle airs below him five bird-like forms, horrible as carrion fowl, yet greater than eagles, cruel as death. Now they swooped near, venturing almost within bowshot of the walls. Now they circled away. "'Black riders!' muttered Pippin. "'Black riders of the air! But see, Berigond, he cried, "'they are looking for something, surely. See how they wheel and swoop, always down to that point over there.' And can you see something moving on the ground? Dark little things. Yes, men on horses. Four or five. Ah, I cannot stand it. Gandalf, Gandalf, save us. Another long screech rose and fell, and he threw himself back again from the wall, panting like a hunted animal. Faint and seemingly remote through that shuddering cry, he heard winding up from below the sound of a trumpet ending on a long, high note. "'Faramir! The Lord Faramir! It is his call!' cried Berigond. "'Brave heart! But how can he win to the gate if these foul hell-hawks have other weapons than fear? But look! They hold on! They will make the gate! No! The horses are running mad! Look! The men are thrown! They are running on foot!' No, one is still up, but he rides back to the others. That will be the captain. He can master both beasts and men. Ah, there one of the foul things is stooping on him. Help, help! Will no one go out to him? Faramir! With that, Berigond sprang away and ran off into the gloom. Ashamed of his terror, while Berigond of the guard thought first of the captain whom he loved, Pippin got up and peered out. At that moment he caught a flash of white and silver coming from the north, like a small star down on the dusky fields. It moved with the speed of an arrow, and grew as it came, converging swiftly with the flight of the four men towards the gate. It seemed to Pippin that a pale light was spread about it, and the heavy shadows gave way before it, and then as it drew near he thought that he heard, like an echo in the walls, a great voice calling, "'Gandalf!' 
he cried. Gandalf, he always turns up when things are darkest. Go on, go on, white rider, Gandalf, Gandalf, he shouted wildly, like an onlooker at a great race urging on a runner who is far beyond encouragement. But now the dark, swooping shadows were aware of the newcomer. One wheeled towards him, but it seemed to Pippin that he raised his hand, and from it a shaft of white light stabbed upwards. The Nazgul gave a long, wailing cry and swerved away, and with that the four others wavered, and then rising in swift spirals they passed away eastward, vanishing into the lowering cloud above, and down on the Pelennor it seemed for a while less dark. Pippin watched, and he saw the horseman and the white rider meet and halt, waiting for those on foot. Men now hurried out to them from the city, and soon they all passed from sight under the outer walls, and he knew that they were entering the gate. Guessing that they would come at once to the tower and the steward, he hurried to the entrance of the citadel. There he was joined by many others who had watched the race and the rescue from the high walls. It was not long before a clamour was heard in the streets leading up from the outer circles, and there was much cheering and crying of the names of Faramir and Mithranda. Presently Pippin saw torches, and followed by a press of people, two horsemen riding slowly. One was in white but shining no longer, pale in the twilight, as if his fire was spent or veiled. The other was dark, and his head was bowed. They dismounted and as grooms took shadow fax and the other horse, they walked forward to the sentinel at the gate. Gandalf steadily, his grey cloak flung back, and a fire still smouldering in his eyes. The other, clad all in green, slowly, swaying a little as a weary or a wounded man. Pippin pressed forward as they passed under the lamp beneath the gate arch, and when he saw the pale face of Faramir, he caught his breath. It was the face of one who has been assailed by a great fear or anguish, but has mastered it, and now is quiet. Proud and grave he stood for a moment as he spoke to the guard, and Pippin, gazing at him, saw how closely he resembled his brother Boromir, whom Pippin had liked from the first, admiring the great man's lordly but kindly manner. Yet suddenly for Faramir his heart was strangely moved with a feeling that he had not known before. Here was one with an air of high nobility such as Aragorn at times revealed, less high perhaps, yet also less incalculable and remote, one of the kings of men born into a later time, but touched with the wisdom and sadness of the elder race. He knew now why Beragond spoke his name with love. He was a captain that men would follow, that he would follow, even under the shadow of the black wings. Faramir! he cried aloud with the others, Faramir! And Faramir, catching his strange voice among the clamour of the men of the city, turned and looked down at him and was amazed. Whence came you? he said. A halfling? And in the livery of the tower? Whence? But with that Gandalf stepped to his side and spoke. He came with me from the land of the halflings, he said. He came with me. But let us not tarry here. There is much to say and to do, and you are weary. He shall come with us, indeed he must, for if he does not forget his new duties more easily than I do, he must attend on his lord again within this hour. Come, Pippin, follow us. So at length they came to the private chamber of the lord of the city. There deep seats were set, about a brazier of charcoal, and wine was brought, and there Pippin, hardly noticed, stood behind the chair of Denethor, and felt his weariness little. So eagerly did he listen to all that was said. When Faramir had taken white bread and drunk a draught of wine, he sat upon a low chair at his father's left hand. Removed a little upon the other side sat Gandalf, in a chair of carven wood, and he seemed at first to be asleep. For at the beginning Faramir spoke only of the errand upon which he had been sent out ten days before and he brought tidings of Ithilien, and of the movements of the enemy and his allies, and he told of the fight on the road, when the men of Harad and their great beast were overthrown, a captain reporting to his master such matters as had often been heard before, small things of border war that now seemed useless and petty, shorn of their renown. 
Then suddenly Faramir looked at Pippin. But now we come to strange matters, he said. For this is not the first halfling that I have seen walking out of the northern legends into the southlands. At that Gandalf sat up and gripped the arms of his chair, but he said nothing, and with a look stopped the exclamation on Pippin's lips. Denethor looked at their faces and nodded his head, as though in sign that he had read much there before it was spoken. Slowly, while the others sat silent and still, Faramir told his tale, with his eyes for the most part on Gandalf, though now and again his glance strayed to Pippin, as if to refresh his memory of others that he had seen. As his story was unfolded, of his meeting with Frodo and his servant, and of the events at Henneth Arnoon, Pippin became aware that Gandalf's hands were trembling as they clutched the carven wood. White they seemed now, and very old, and as he looked at them, suddenly with a thrill of fear, Pippin knew that Gandalf, Gandalf himself, was troubled, even afraid. The air of the room was close and still. At last, when Faramir spoke of his parting with the travellers, and of their resolve to go to Kirith Ungol, his voice fell, and he shook his head and sighed. Then Gandalf sprang up. Kirith Ungol? Morgul Vale, he said. The time, Faramir, the time. When did you part with them? When would they reach that accursed valley? I parted with them in the morning two days ago, said Faramir. It is fifteen leagues thence to the vale of the Morgulduin, if they went straight south, and then they would be still five leagues westward of the accursed tower. At swiftest they could not come there before today, and maybe they have not come there yet. Indeed, I see what you fear, but the darkness is not due to their venture. It began yester-eve, and all Ithilien was under shadow last night. It is clear to me that the enemy has long planned an assault on us, and its hour has already been determined before ever the travellers left my keeping. Gandalf paced the floor. The morning of two days ago, nigh on three days of journey. How far is the place where you parted? Some twenty-five leagues as a bird flies, answered Faramir. But I could not come more swiftly. Yesterday eve I lay at Caer Andros, the long isle in the river northward, which we hold in defence, and horses are kept on the hither bank. As the dark drew on, I knew that haste was needed, so I rode thence with three others that could also be horsed. The rest of my company I sent south to strengthen the garrison at the fords of Osgiliath. I hope that I have not done ill. He looked at his father. Ill? cried Denethor, and his eyes flashed suddenly. Why do you ask? The men were under your command. Or do you ask for my judgment on all your deeds? Your bearing is lowly in my presence, yet it is long now since you turned from your own way at my counsel. See, you have spoken skilfully as ever, but I, have I not seen your eye fixed on Mithranda, seeking whether you said well or too much? He has long had your heart in his keeping. My son, your father is old, but not yet dotard. I can see and hear, as was my wont, and little of what you have said or left unsaid is now hidden from me. I know the answer to many riddles. Alas, alas for Boromir! If what I have done displeases you, my father, said Faramir quietly, I wish I had known your counsel before the burden of so weighty a judgment was thrust on me. Would that have availed to change your judgment? said Denethor. You would still have done just so, I deem. I know you well. Ever your desire is to appear lordly and generous as a king of old, gracious, gentle. That may well befit one of high race, if he sits in power and peace, but in desperate hours gentleness may be repaid with death. So be it, said Faramir. So be it, cried Denethor, but not with your death only, Lord Faramir, with the death also of your father and of all your people, whom it is your part to protect now that Boromir is gone. Do you wish, then, said Faramir, that our places had been exchanged? Yes, I wish that indeed, said Denethor, for Boromir was loyal to me and no wizard's pupil. He would have remembered his father's need, and would not have squandered what fortune gave. He would have brought me a mighty gift. 
For a moment Faramir's restraint gave way. I would ask you, my father, to remember why it was that I, not he, was in Ithilien. On one occasion at least your counsel has prevailed, not long ago. It was the lord of the city that gave the errand to him. Stir not the bitterness in the cup that I mixed for myself, said Denethor. Have I not tasted it now many nights upon my tongue, foreboding that worse yet lay in the dregs, as now indeed I find? Would it were not so, would that this thing had come to me? Comfort yourself, said Gandalf. In no case would Boromir have brought it to you. He is dead and died well. May he sleep in peace. Yet you deceive yourself. He would have stretched out his hand to this thing, and taking it, he would have fallen. He would have kept it for his own, and when he returned, you would not have known your son. The face of Denethor set hard and cold. You found Boromir less apt to your hand, did you not? he said softly. But I, who was his father, say that he would have brought it to me. You are wise, maybe, Mithrandir, yet with all your subtleties you have not all wisdom. Counsels may be found that are neither the webs of wizards nor the haste of fools. I have in this matter more law and wisdom than you deem. What, then, is your wisdom? said Gandalf. Enough to perceive that there are two follies to avoid. To use this thing is perilous. At this hour, to send it in the hands of a witless halfling into the land of the enemy himself, as you have done, and this son of mine, that is madness. And the Lord Denethor, what would he have done? Neither. But most surely not for any argument would he have set the thing at a hazard beyond all but a fool's hope, risking our utter ruin if the enemy should recover what he lost. Nay, it should have been kept hidden, hidden dark and deep. Not used, I say, unless at the uttermost end of need, but set beyond his grasp, save by a victory so final that what then befell would not trouble us, being dead. You think, as is your wont, my lord, of Gondor only, said Gandalf. Yet there are other men and other lives, and time still to be. And for me, I pity even his slaves." "'And where will other men look for help if Gondor falls?' answered Denethor. "'If I had this thing now in the deep vaults of this citadel, "'we should not then shake with dread under this gloom, "'fearing the worst, and our counsels would be undisturbed. "'If you don't trust me to endure the test, you don't know me yet.' "'Nevertheless, I do not trust you,' said Gandalf. "'Had I done so?' I could have sent this thing hither to your keeping, and spared myself and others much anguish. And now, hearing you speak, I trust you less, no more than Boromir. Nay, stay your wrath. I do not trust myself in this, and I refuse this thing, even as a freely given gift. You are strong, and can still in some matters govern yourself, Denethor. Yet if you had received this thing, it would have overthrown you, were it buried beneath the roots of Bindolywin. Still it would burn your mind away, as the darkness grows, and the yet worse things follow that soon will come upon us. For a moment the eyes of Denethor glowed again as he faced Gandalf, and Pippin felt once more the strain between their wills. But now almost it seemed as if their glances were like blades from eye to eye, flickering as they fenced. Pippin trembled, fearing some dreadful stroke. But suddenly Denethor relaxed and grew cold again. He shrugged his shoulders. "'If I had, if you had,' he said, "'such words and ifs are vain. "'It has gone into the shadow, "'and only time will show what doom awaits it and us. "'The time will not be long. "'In what is left, let all who fight the enemy in their fashion be at one, "'and keep hope while they may.' and after hope still the hardihood to die free. He turned to Faramir. What think you of the garrison at Osgiliath? It is not strong, said Faramir. I have sent the company of Ithilien to strengthen it, as I have said. Not enough, I deem, said Dedethor. It is there that the first blow will fall. They will have need of some stout captain there. There and elsewhere in many places, said Faramir. And sighed. 
Alas, for my brother, whom I too loved, he rose. May I have your leave, father? And then he swayed and leaned upon his father's chair. You are weary, I see, said Denethor. You have ridden fast and far, and under shadows of evil in the air, I am told. Let us not speak of that, said Faramir. Then we will not, said Denethor. Go now and rest as you may. Tomorrow's need will be sterner. All now took leave of the lord of the city, and went to rest while they still could. Outside there was a starless blackness as Gandalf, with Pippin beside him bearing a small torch, made his way to their lodging. They did not speak until they were behind closed doors. Then at last Pippin took Gandalf's hand. "'Tell me,' he said, "'is there any hope? For Frodo, I mean, or at least mostly for Frodo.' Gandalf put his hand on Pippin's head. "'There never was much hope,' he answered. "'Just a fool's hope, as I've been told. "'And when I heard of Kirith Ungol, "'he broke off and strode to the window, "'as if his eyes could pierce the night in the east. "'Kirith Ungol,' he muttered. "'Why that way, I wonder?' he turned. "'Just now, Pippin, my heart almost failed me. Hearing that name, and yet in truth I believe that the news that Faramir brings has some hope in it, for it seems clear that our enemy has opened his war at last, and made the first move while Frodo was still free. So now, for many days, he will have his eye turned this way and that, away from his own land. And yet, Pippin, I feel from afar his haste and fear. He has begun sooner than he would. Something has happened to stir him. Gandalf stood for a moment in thought. Maybe, he muttered, maybe even your foolishness helped, my lad. Let me see. Some five days ago now he would discover that we had thrown down Saruman and had taken the stone. Still, what of that? We could not use it to much purpose, or without his knowing. Ah, I wonder. Aragorn! His time draws near. And he is strong and stern underneath Pippin, bold, determined, able to take his own counsel and dare great risks at need. That may be it. He may have used the stone and shown himself to the enemy, challenging him for this very purpose. I wonder. Well, we shall not know the answer till the riders of Rohan come, if they do not come too late. There are evil days ahead. To sleep while we may. But— said Pippin. "'But what?' said Gandalf. "'Only one but will I allow to-night.' Gollum, said Pippin. "'How on earth could they be going about with him, even following him? And I could see that Faramir didn't like the place he was taking them to any more than you do. What's wrong?' "'I cannot answer that now,' said Gandalf. "'Yet my heart guessed that Frodo and Gollum would meet before the end. For good?' or for evil. But of Kirith Ungal I will not speak to-night. Treachery, treachery, I fear, treachery of that miserable creature. But so it must be. Let us remember that a traitor may betray himself, and do good that he does not intend. It can be so, sometimes. Good night. The next day came with a morning like a brown dusk, and the hearts of men lifted for a while by the return of Faramir, sank low again. The winged shadows were not seen again that day, yet ever and anon, high above the city, a faint cry would come, and many who heard it would stand stricken with a passing dread, while the less stout-hearted quailed and wept. And now Faramir was gone again. They give him no rest, some murmured. The Lord drives his son too hard, and now he must do the duty of two, for himself and for the one that will not return. And ever men looked northward, asking, Where are the riders of Rohan? In truth, Fanamir did not go by his own choosing. But the Lord of the city was master of his council, and he was in no mood that day to bow to others. Early in the morning the council had been summoned. There all the captains judged, 
that because of the threat in the south their force was too weak to make any stroke of war on their own part, unless perchance the riders of Rohan yet should come. Meanwhile they must man the walls and wait. Yet, said Denethor, we should not lightly abandon the outer defences. The ram has made with so great a labour, and the enemy must pay dearly for the crossing of the river. That he cannot do, in force to assail the city, either north of Caia Andros because of the marshes, or southwards towards Lebenin because of the breadth of the river that needs many boats. It is at Osgiliath that he will put forth his weight, as before when Boromir denied him the passage. That was but a trial, said Faramir. Today we may make the enemy pay ten times our loss at the passage, and yet rule the exchange, for he can afford to lose a host better than we to lose a company, and the retreat of those that we put out far afield will be perilous if he wins across in force. And what of Caia Andros? said the prince. That too must be held, if Osgiliath is defended. Let us not forget the danger on our left. The Rohirrim may come, and they may not. But Faramir has told us of great strength drawing ever to the Black Gate. More than one host may issue from it, and strike for more than one passage. Much must be risked in war, said Denethor. Kaya Andros is manned, and no more can be sent so far. But I will not yield the river and the Pelennor unfought. Not if there is a captain here who has still the courage to do his lord's will. Then all were silent, but at length Faramir said, I do not oppose your will, sire. Since you are robbed of Boromir, I will go and do what I can in his stead, if you command it. I do so, said Denethor. Then farewell, said Faramir. But if I should return, think better of me. "'That depends on the manner of your return,' said Denethor. Gandalf it was that last spoke to Faramir ere he rode east. "'Do not throw your life away rashly or in bitterness,' he said. "'You will be needed here for other things than war. "'Your father loves you, Faramir, and will remember it ere the end. "'Farewell.' "'So now the Lord Faramir had gone forth again.' and had taken with him such strength of men as were willing to go or could be spared. On the walls some gazed through the gloom towards the ruined city, and they wondered what chanced there, for nothing could be seen, and others, as ever, looked north and counted the leagues to Theoden in Rohan. Will he come? Will he remember our old alliance? they said. Yes, he will come, said Gandalf, even if he comes too late. But think— at best the Red Arrow cannot have reached him more than two days ago, and the miles are long from Edoras. It was night again ere news came. A man rode in haste from the fords, saying that a host had issued from Minas Morgul, and was already drawing nigh to us Gilead, and it had been joined by regiments from the south, Haradrim, cruel and tall. And we have learned— said the messenger, that the black captain leads them once again, and the fear of him has passed before him over the river. With those ill-boding words, the third day closed since Pippin came to Minas Tirith. Few went to rest, for small hope had any now that even Faramir could hold the fords for long. The next day, though the darkness had reached its full and grew no deeper, it weighed heavier on men's hearts, and a great dread was on them. Ill news came soon again. The passage of Andwin was won by the enemy. Faramir was retreating to the wall of the Pelennor, rallying his men to the causeway forts, but he was ten times outnumbered. "'If he wins back at all across the Pelennor, his enemies will be on his heels,' said the messenger. "'They've paid dear for the crossing, but less dearly than we hoped.' The plan has been well laid. It is now seen that in secret they have long been building floats and barges in great numbers in East Gilead. They swarmed across like beetles. But it is the black captain that defeats us. Few will stand and abide even the rumour of his coming. 
his own folk quail at him, and they would slay themselves at his bidding. Then I am needed there more than here, said Gandalf, and rode off at once, and the glimmer of him faded soon from sight. And all that night Pippin alone and sleepless stood upon the wall and gazed eastward. The bells of day had scarcely rung out again, a mockery in the unlightened dark, when far away he saw fires spring up, across in the dim spaces where the walls of the Pelennor stood. The watchmen cried aloud, and all men in the city stood to arms. Now ever and anon there was a red flash, and slowly through the heavy air dull rumbles could be heard. "'They have taken the wall!' men cried. "'They are blasting breaches in it. They are coming!' "'Where is Faramir?' cried Bergond in dismay. "'Say not that he has fallen!' It was Gandalf that brought the first tidings. With a handful of horsemen he came in the middle morning, riding as escort to a line of wains. They were filled with wounded men, all that could be saved from the wreck of the causeway forts. At once he went to Denethor. The lord of the city now sat in a high chamber above the hall of the White Tower, with Pippin at his side, and through the dim windows, north and south and east, he bent his dark eyes, as if to pierce the shadows of doom that ringed him round. Most to the north he looked, and would pause at whiles to listen, as if by some ancient art his ears might hear the thunder of hooves on the plains far away. "'Is Faramir come?' he asked. "'No,' said Gandalf. "'But he still lived when I left him. Yet he is resolved to stay with the rearguard, lest the retreat over the Pelennor become a rout. He may, perhaps, hold his men together long enough, but I doubt it. He is pitted against a foe too great, for one has come that I feared. "'Not the Dark Lord!' cried Pippin, forgetting his place in his terror. Denethor laughed bitterly. "'Nay, not yet, Master Peregrine. He will not come save only to triumph over me when all is won.' He uses others as his weapons. So do all great lords, if they are wise, Master Halfling. Or why should I sit here in my tower and think and watch and wait, spending even my sons? For I can still wield a brand. He stood up and cast open his long black cloak, and behold, he was clad in mail beneath, and girt with a long sword, great hilted in a sheath of black and silver. Thus have I walked, and thus now for many years have I slept, he said, lest with age the body should grow soft and timid. Yet now under the lord of barad the most fell of all his captains, is already master of your outer walls, said Gandalf. King of Angmar, long ago, sorcerer, ringwraith, lord of the Nazgul, a spear of terror in the hand of Sauron, shadow of despair. Then, Mithrandir, you had a foe to match you, said Denethor. For myself, I've long known who is the chief captain of the hosts of the Dark Tower. Is this all that you have returned to say? Or can it be that you have withdrawn because you were overmatched? Pippin trembled, fearing that Gandalf would be stung to sudden wrath, but his fear was needless. It might be so, Gandalf answered softly. But our trial of strength is not yet come, and if words spoken of old be true, not by the hand of man shall he fall, and hidden from the wise is the doom that awaits him. However that may be, the captain of despair does not press forward, yet he rules rather according to the wisdom that you have just spoken, from the rear, driving his slaves in madness on before. Nay, I came rather to guard the hurt men, that can yet be healed, for the Ramas is breached far and wide, and soon the host of Morgul will enter in at many points, and I came chiefly to say this. Soon there will be battle on the fields, a sortie must be made ready. Let it be of mounted men. In them lies our brief hope, for in one thing only is the enemy still poorly provided. He has few horsemen. And we also have few. Now would the coming of Rohan be in the nick of time, said Denethor. We are likely to see other newcomers first, said Gandalf. Fugitives from Kaya Andros have already reached us. 
the isle has fallen. Another army has come from the Black Gate, crossing from the northeast. Some have accused you, Mithrandir, of delighting to bear ill news, said Denethor. But to me this is no longer news. It was known to me ere nightfall yesterday. As for the sortie, I had already given thought to it. Let us go down. Time passed. At length watchers on the walls could see the retreat of the outcompanies. Small bands of weary and often wounded men came first with little order. Some were running wildly as if pursued. Away to the eastward the distant fires flickered, and now it seemed that here and there they crept across the plain. Houses and barns were burning. Then from many points little rivers of red flame came hurrying on, winding through the gloom, converging towards the line of the broad road that led from the city gate to Osgiliath. The enemy, men murmured, the dike is down. Here they come, pouring through the breaches, and they carry torches, it seems. Where are our own folk? It drew now to evening by the hour and the light was so dim that even far-sighted men upon the citadel could discern little clearly out upon the fields, save only the burnings that ever multiplied, and the lines of fire that grew in length and speed. At last, less than a mile from the city, a more ordered mass of men came into view, marching, not running, still holding together. The watchers held their breath. "'Faramir must be there,' they said. "'He can govern man and beast.' He will make it yet. Now the main retreat was scarcely two furlongs distant. Out of the gloom behind, a small company of horsemen galloped, all that was left of the rear guard. Once again they turned at bay, facing the oncoming lines of fire. Then suddenly there was a tumult of fierce cries. Horsemen of the enemy swept up. The lines of fire became flowing torrents, file upon file of orcs bearing flames, and wild Southron men with red banners, shouting with harsh tongues, surging up, overtaking the retreat. And with a piercing cry, out of the dim sky fell the winged shadows, the Nazgul stooping to the kill. The retreat became a rout. Already men were breaking away, flying wild and witless here and there, flinging away their weapons, crying out in fear, falling to the ground. And then a trumpet rang from the citadel, and Denethor at last released the sortie. Drawn up within the shadow of the gate, and under the looming walls outside, they had waited for his signal. All the mounted men that were left in the city. Now they sprang forward, formed, quickened to a gallop, and charged with a great shout. And from the walls an answering shout went up. For foremost on the field rode the swan knights of Dol Amroth, with their prince and his blue banner at their head. Amroth for Gondor, they cried, Amroth to Faramir. Like thunder they broke upon the enemy on either flank of the retreat. But one rider outran them all, swift as the wind in the grass. Shadowfax bore him, shining, unveiled once more, a light starting from his upraised hand. The Nazgul screeched and swept away, for their captain was not yet come to challenge the white fire of his foe. The hosts of Morgul, intent on their prey, taken at unawares in wild career, broke, scattering like sparks in a gale. The out-companies, with a great cheer, turned and smote their pursuers. Hunters became the hunted. The retreat became an onslaught. The field was strewn with stricken orcs and men, and a reek arose of torches cast away. "'sputtering out in swirling smoke. "'The cavalry rode on. "'But Denethor did not permit them to go far. "'Though the enemy was checked, "'and for the moment driven back, "'great forces were flowing in from the east. "'Again the trumpet rang, sounding the retreat. "'The cavalry of Gondor halted. "'Behind their screen the out-companies reformed. "'Now steadily they came marching back. "'They reached the gate of the city and entered.' stepping proudly, and proudly the people of the city looked on them, and cried their praise, and yet they were troubled in heart, for the companies were grievously reduced. Faramir had lost a third of his men, and where was he? Last of all he came, his men passed in, the mounted knights returned, and at their rear 
the banner of Dol Amroth, and the prince. And in his arms before him on his horse he bore the body of his kinsman, Faramir, son of Denethor, found upon the stricken field. Faramir! Faramir! men cried, weeping in the streets. But he did not answer, and they bore him away up the winding road to the citadel and his father. Even as the Nazgul had swerved aside from the onset of the white rider, there came flying a deadly dart, and Faramir, as he held at bay a mounted champion of Harad, had fallen to the earth. Only the charge of Dol Amroth had saved him from the red Southland swords that would have hewed him as he lay. The Prince Imrahil brought Faramir to the White Tower, and he said, Your son has returned, Lord, after great deeds, and he told all that he had seen. But Denethor rose and looked on the face of his son and was silent. Then he bade them make a bed in the chamber and lay Faramir upon it and depart. But he himself went up alone into the secret room under the summit of the tower, and many who looked up thither at that time saw a pale light that gleamed and flickered from the narrow windows for a while, and then flashed and went out. And when Denethor descended again, he went to Faramir and sat beside him without speaking, but the face of the Lord was grey, more death-like than his son's. So now at last the city was besieged, enclosed in a ring of foes. The Ramas was broken, and all the Pelennor abandoned to the enemy. The last word to come from outside the walls was brought by men flying down the northward road ere the gate was shut. They were the remnant of the guard that was kept at that point where the way from Anorian and Rohan ran into the townlands. Ingold led them, the same who had admitted Gandalf and Pippin less than five days before, while the sun still rose and there was hope in the morning. "'There is no news of the Rohirrim,' he said. "'Rohan will not come now, or if they come, it will not avail us. The new host that we had tidings of has come first, from over the river by way of Andros, it is said. They are strong, but talions of orcs of the eye.' and countless companies of men of a new sort that we have not met before. Not tall, but broad and grim, bearded like dwarves, wielding great axes. Out of some savage land in the wide east they come, we deem. They hold the northward road, and many have passed on into an Orion. The Rohirrim cannot come. The gate was shut. All night watchmen on the walls heard the rumour of the enemy that roamed outside, burning field and tree, and hewing any man that they found abroad, living or dead. The numbers that had already passed over the river could not be guessed in the darkness, but when morning, or its dim shadow, stole over the plain, it was seen that even fear by night had scarcely overcounted them. The plain was dark with their marching companies, and as far as eyes could strain in the murk there sprouted, like a foul fungus growth, all about the beleaguered city great camps of tents, black or sombre red. Busy as ants hurrying orcs were digging, digging lines of deep trenches in a huge ring, just out of bowshot from the walls, and as the trenches were made each was filled with fire though how it was kindled or fed, by art or devilry, none could see. All day the labour went forward, while the men of Minas Tirith looked on, unable to hinder it. And as each length of trench was completed, they could see great wains approaching, and soon yet more companies of the enemy were swiftly setting up, each behind the cover of a trench, great engines for the casting of missiles. There were none upon the city walls large enough to reach so far or to stay the work. At first men laughed and did not greatly fear such devices, for the main wall of the city was of great height and marvellous thickness, built ere the power and craft of Numenor waned in exile, and its outward face was like to the tower of Orthanc, hard and dark and smooth, unconquerable by steel or fire, unbreakable except by some convulsion that would rend the very earth on which it stood. Nay, they said, not if the nameless one himself should come. Not even he could enter here while we yet live. But some answered, while we yet live? How long? He has a weapon that has brought low many strong places since the world began. Hunger. The roads are cut. 
Rohan will not come. But the engines did not waste shot upon the indomitable wall. It was no brigand or orc chieftain that ordered the assault upon the Lord of Mordor's greatest foe. A power and mind of malice guided it. As soon as the great catapults were set, with many yells and the creaking of rope and winch, they began to throw missiles marvellously high, so that they passed right above the battlement and fell thudding within the first circle of the city, and many of them, by some secret art, burst into flame as they came toppling down. Soon there was great peril of fire behind the wall, and all who could be spared were busy quelling the flames that sprang up in many places. Then among the greater castes there fell another hail, less ruinous but more horrible. All about the streets and lanes behind the gate it tumbled down, small round shot that did not burn. But when men ran to learn what it might be, they cried aloud or wept, for the enemy was flinging into the city all the heads of those who had fallen fighting at Osgiliath, or on the Ramas, or in the field. They were grim to look on, for though some were crushed and shapeless, and some had been cruelly hewn, yet many had features that could be told, and it seemed that they had died in pain, and all were branded with a foul token of the lidless eye. But marred and dishonoured as they were, it often chanced that thus a man would see again the face of someone that he had known, who had walked proudly once in arms, or tilled the fields, or ridden in upon a holiday from the green vales in the hills. In vain men shook their fists at the pitiless foes that swarmed before the gate. Curses they heeded not, nor understood the tongues of western men, crying with harsh voices like beasts and carrion birds. But soon there were few left in Minas Tirith who had the heart to stand up and defy the hosts of Mordor. For yet another weapon, swifter than hunger, the Lord of the Dark Tower had, dread and despair. The Nazgul came again, and as their dark lord now grew and put forth his strength, so their voices, which uttered only his will and his malice, were filled with evil and horror. Ever they circled above the city, like vultures that expect their fill of doomed men's flesh. Out of sight and shot they flew, and yet were ever present, and their deadly voices rent the air. More unbearable they became, not less, at each new cry. At length even the stout-hearted would fling themselves to the ground as the hidden menace passed over them, or they would stand, letting their weapons fall from nerveless hands while into their minds a blackness came, and they thought no more of war, but only of hiding and of crawling and of death. During all this black day Faramir lay upon his bed in the chamber of the White Tower, wandering in a desperate fever. Dying, someone said, and soon dying, all men were saying upon the walls and in the streets. And by him his father sat, and said nothing, but watched, and gave no longer any heed to the defence. No hours so dark had Pippin known, not even the clutches of the uruk -hai. It was his duty to wait upon the Lord, and wait he did, forgotten, it seemed, standing by the door of the unlit chamber, mastering his own fears as best he could. And as he watched, it seemed to him that Denethor grew old before his eyes, as if something had snapped in his proud will, and his stern mind was overthrown. Grief, maybe, had wrought it, and remorse. He saw tears on that once tearless face, more unbearable than wrath. "'Do not weep, Lord,' he stammered. Perhaps he will get well. Have you asked Gandalf? Comfort me not with wizards, said Denethor. The fool's hope has failed. The enemy has found it, and now his power waxes. He sees our very thoughts, and all we do is ruinous. I sent my son forth, unthanked, unblessed, out into needless peril, and here he lies with poison in his veins. Nay, nay. Whatever may now betide in war, my line too is ending. Even the house of the stewards has failed. Mean folk shall rule the last remnant of the kings of men, lurking in the hills until all are hounded out. 
Men came to the door, crying for the lord of the city. "'Nay, I will not come down,' he said. "'I must stay beside my son. He might still speak before the end, but that is near. Follow whom you will, even the grave fool, though his hope has failed. Here I stay.' So it was that Gandalf took command of the last defence of the city of Gondor. Wherever he came, men's hearts would lift again, and the winged shadows pass from memory. Tirelessly he strode from citadel to gate, from north to south about the wall, and with him went the prince of Dol Amroth in his shining mail. For he and his knights still held themselves like lords in whom the race of Numenor ran true. Men that saw them whispered, saying, Belike the old tales speak well. There is elvish blood in the veins of that folk, for the people of Nimrodel dwelt in that land once long ago. And then one would sing amid the gloom some staves of the lay of Nimrodel, or other songs of the Vale of Anduin out of vanished years. And yet, when they had gone, the shadows closed on men again, and their hearts went cold, and the valour of Gondor withered into ash. And so slowly they passed out of a dim day of fears into the darkness of a desperate night. Fires now raged unchecked in the first circle of the city, and the garrison upon the outer wall was already in many places cut off from retreat. But the faithful who remained there at their posts were few. Most had fled beyond the second gate. Far behind the battle, the river had been swiftly bridged, and all day more force and gear of war had poured across. Now at last, in the middle night, the assault was loosed. The vanguard passed through the trenches of fire by many devious paths that had been left between them. On they came, reckless of their loss as they approached, still bunched and herded within the range of bowmen on the wall. But indeed, there were too few now left there to do them great damage. Though the light of the fires showed up many a mark for archers of such skill as Gondor once had boasted. Then, perceiving that the valour of the city was already beaten down, the hidden captain put forth his strength. Slowly the great siege towers built in Osgiliath rolled forward through the dark. Messengers came again to the chamber in the White Tower, and Pippin let them enter, for they were urgent. Denethor turned his head slowly from Faramir's face, and looked at them silently. "'The first circle of the city is burning, Lord,' they said. "'What are your commands? You are still the Lord and steward. Not all will follow Mithrandir. Men are flying from the walls, and leaving them unmanned.' "'Why? Why do the fools fly?' said Denethor. "'Better to burn sooner than late, for burn we must. Go back to your bonfire.' And I, I will go now to my power, to my power. No tomb for Denethor and Faramir, no tomb. No long slow sleep of death embalmed. We will burn like heathen kings before ever a ship sailed hither from the west. The west has failed. Go back and burn. The messengers, without bow or answer, turned and fled. Now Denethor stood up and released the fevered hand of Faramir that he had held. "'He is burning, already burning,' he said sadly. "'The house of his spirit crumbles.' Then, stepping softly towards Pippin, he looked down at him. "'Farewell,' he said. "'Farewell, peregrine son of Paladin. Your service has been short, and now it is drawing to an end. I release you from the little that remains. Go now.' and die in what way seems best to you, and with whom you will, even that friend whose folly brought you to this death. Send for my servants, and then go. Farewell. I will not say farewell, my lord, said Pippin, kneeling. And then suddenly, hobbit-like once more, he stood up and looked the old man in the eyes. I will take your leave, sir, he said, for I want to see Gandalf very much indeed. But he's no fool, and I will not think of dying until he despairs of life. But from my word and your service I do not wish to be released while you live, and if they come at last to the citadel, I hope to be here and stand before you and earn, perhaps, the alms that you have given me. Do as you will, Master Halfling, said Denethor, 
but my life is broken. Send for my servants. He turned back to Faramir. Pippin left him, and called for the servants, and they came. Six men of the household, strong and fair, yet they trembled at the summons. But in a quiet voice Denethor bade them lay warm coverlets on Faramir's bed and take it up. And they did so, and lifting up the bed, they bore it from the chamber. Slowly they paced to trouble the fevered man as little as might be, and Denethor, now bending on a staff, followed them. And last came Pippin. Out from the white tower they walked, as if to a funeral, out into the darkness, where the overhanging cloud was lit beneath with flickers of dull red. Softly they paced the great courtyard, and at a word from Denethor halted beside the withered tree. All was silent, save for the rumour of war in the city down below, and they heard the water dripping sadly from the dead branches into the dark pool. Then they went on through the citadel gate, where the sentinels stared at them in wonder and dismay as they passed by. Turning westward, they came at length to a door in the rearward wall of the sixth circle. Fen Holland it was called, for it was kept ever shut, save at times of funeral, and only the lord of the city might use that way, or those who bore the token of the tombs and tended the houses of the dead. Beyond it went a winding road, that descended in many curves down to the narrow land, under the shadow of Mindoloin's precipice, where stood the mansions of the dead kings and of their stewards. A porter sat in a little house beside the way, and with fear in his eyes he came forth bearing a lantern in his hand. At the Lord's command he unlocked the door, and silently it swung back, and they passed through, taking the lanterns from his hand. It was dark on the climbing road between ancient walls and many pillared balusters looming in the swaying lantern beams. Their slow feet echoed as they walked down, down, until at last they came to the silent street, Rath Dinan, between pale domes and empty halls and images of men long dead, and they entered into the house of the stewards and set down their burden. There Pippin, staring uneasily about him, saw that he was in a wide vaulted chamber, draped, as it were, with the great shadows that the little lantern threw upon its shrouded walls, and dimly to be seen were many rows of tables, carved of marble, and upon each table lay a sleeping form, hands folded, head pillowed upon stone. But one table near at hand stood broad and bare. Upon it at a sign from Denethor they laid Faramir and his father side by side, and covered them with one covering, and stood then with bowed heads as mourners beside a bed of death. Then Denethor spoke in a low voice. Here we will wait, he said, but send not for the embalmers. Bring us wood quick to burn, and lay it all about us and beneath, and pour oil upon it. And when I bid you thrust in a torch, do this and speak no more to me. Farewell. By your leave, Lord, said Pippin, and turned and fled in terror from the deathly house. Poor Faramir, he thought. I must find Gandalf. Poor Faramir! Quite lightly he needs medicine more than tears. Oh, where can I find Gandalf? In the thick of things, I suppose, and he will have no time to spare for dying men or madmen. At the door he turned to one of the servants, who had remained on guard there. Your master is not himself, he said. Go slow. Bring no fire to this place while Faramir lives. Do nothing until Gandalf comes. Who is the master of Minas Tirith? the man answered. The Lord Denethor, or the Grey Wanderer? The Grey Wanderer, or no one, it would seem, said Pippin. And he sped back and up the winding way as swiftly as his feet would carry him, past the astonished porter, out through the door, and on, till he came near the gate of the citadel. The sentinel hailed him as he went by, and he recognized the voice of Beragond. Whither do you run, Master Peregrine? he cried. To find Mithrandir, Pippin answered. The Lord's errands are urgent, and should not be hindered by me, said Beragond. But tell me quickly, if you may, what goes forward? Whither has my Lord gone? I've just come on duty, 
but I heard that he passed towards the closed door, and men were bearing Faramir before him. Yes, said Pippin, to the silent street. Berigon bowed his head to hide his tears. They said that he was dying, he sighed, and now he is dead. No, said Pippin, not yet, and even now his death might be prevented, I think. But the lord of the city, Berigon, has fallen before his city is taken. He is fey and dangerous. Quickly he told of Denethor's strange words and deeds. I must find Gandalf at once. Then you must go down to the battle. I know. The Lord has given me leave. But, Berigon, if you can, do something to stop any dreadful thing happening. The Lord does not permit those who wear the black and silver to leave their post for any cause, save at his own command. Well, you must choose between orders and the life of Faramir, said Pippin. And as for orders, I think you have a madman to deal with, not a lord. I must run. I will return if I can. He ran on, down, down towards the outer city. Men flying back from the burning passed him, and some, seeing his livery, turned and shouted, but he paid no heed. At last he was through the second gate, beyond which great fires leapt up between the walls, yet it seemed strangely silent. No noise or shouts of battle or din of arms could be heard. Then suddenly there was a dreadful cry and a great shock, and a deep echoing boom. Forcing himself on against a gust of fear and horror that shook him almost to his knees, Pippin turned a corner, opening on the wide place behind the city gate. He stopped dead. He had found Gandalf, but he shrank back, cowering into a shadow. Ever since the middle night the great assault had gone on. The drums rolled. To the north and to the south, company upon company of the enemy pressed to the walls. There came great beasts, like moving houses in the red and fitful light. The Mumakil of the Harad dragging through the lanes amid the fires huge towers and engines. Yet their captain cared not greatly what they did or how many might be slain. Their purpose was only to test the strength of the defence, and to keep the men of Gondor busy in many places. It was against the gate that he would throw his heaviest weight. Very strong it might be, wrought of steel and iron, and guarded with towers and bastions of indomitable stone, yet it was the key, the weakest point in all that high and impenetrable wall. The drums rolled louder. Fires leapt up. Great engines crawled across the field, and in the midst was a huge ram, great as a forest tree a hundred feet in length, swinging on mighty chains. Long had it been forging in the dark smithies of Mordor, and its hideous head, founded of black steel, was shaped in the likeness of a ravening wolf on its spells of ruin lay. Grond, they named it, in memory of the hammer of the underworld of old, Great beasts drew it, orcs surrounded it, and behind walked mountain trolls to wield it. But about the gate resistance still was stout, and there the knights of Dol Amroth and the hardiest of the garrison stood at bay. Shot and dart fell thick, siege towers crashed or blazed suddenly like torches. All before the walls on either side of the gate the ground was choked with wreck and with bodies of the slain, yet still driven as by a madness more and more came up. Grond crawled on. Upon its housing no fire would catch, and though now and again some great beast that hauled it would go mad and spread stamping ruin among the orcs innumerable that guarded it, their bodies were cast aside from its path, and others took their place. Grond crawled on. The drums rolled wildly. Over the hills of slain a hideous shape appeared, a horseman, tall, hooded, cloaked in black. Slowly, trampling the fallen, he rode forth, heeding no longer any dart. He halted and held up a long, pale sword, and as he did so a great fear fell on all, defender and foe alike, and the hands of men drooped to their sides, and no bow sang. For a moment all was still. The drums rolled and rattled. With a vast rush, Grond was hurled forward by huge hands. It reached the gate. It swung. A deep boom rumbled through the city, like thunder running in the clouds. 
but the doors of iron and posts of steel withstood the stroke. Then the black captain rose in his stirrups and cried aloud in a dreadful voice, speaking in some forgotten tongue words of power and terror to rend both heart and stone. Thrice he cried. Thrice the great ram boomed, and suddenly upon the last stroke the gate of Gondor broke. As if stricken by some blasting spell, it burst asunder. There was a flash of searing lightning, and the doors tumbled in ribbon fragments to the ground. In rode the lord of the Nazgul, a great black sheep against the fires beyond he loomed up, grown to a vast menace of despair. In rode the lord of the Nazgul, under the archway that no enemy ever yet had passed, and all fled before his face. All save one. There waiting... Silent and still in the space before the gate sat Gandalf upon Shadowfax. Shadowfax, who alone among the free horses of the earth endured the terror, unmoving, steadfast as a graven image in wrath Dedan. You cannot enter here, said Gandalf, and the huge shadow halted. Go back to the abyss prepared for you. Go back. Fall into the nothingness that awaits you and your master. Go! The black rider flung back his hood, and behold, he had a kingly crown, and yet upon no head visible was it set. The red fires shone between it and the mantle's shoulders vast and dark. From a mouth unseen there came a deadly laughter. Old fool, he said, old fool. Fool, this is my hour. Do you not know death when you see it? Die now and curse in vain. And with that he lifted high his sword, and flames ran down the blade. Gandalf did not move, and in that very moment, away behind in some courtyard of the city, a cock crowed. Shrill and clear he crowed, wrecking nothing of wizardry or war, welcoming only the morning that in the sky far above the shadows of death was coming with the dawn. And as if in answer there came from far away another note, Horns! 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 In dark Mindolwen sides they dimly echoed, great horns of the north wildly blowing, Rohan had come at last!'